So now the clock is 12. So uh, once again, welcome back to the afternoon session of this seminar. We have four more interesting uh, presentations to look forward during the afternoon. First, a special welcome to Ivan Lund from Momentum Technologies, who will uh, tell us about the vibration problems in the oil and gas industry and how they work on using uh, damp different dampings in order to uh, to lower those uh, vibration levels. So we, very interesting to hear your uh, experience from the oil and gas industry. So please, even. Thank you. So uh, uh, first, thank you for being invited to this uh, seminar. Um, I uh, am going to try to draw some parallels between the uh, oil and gas industry and the nuclear industry, and uh, also showcase uh, uh, tune mass damper use. So uh, first off, uh, I'd like to present me. I'm Evan Lund, and uh, I'm an R&D manager in Momentum Technologies. And uh, I've studied mechanical engineering with a degree in uh, 2000. And ever since then, I've been working on vibration. Uh, so about 21 years now with uh, applied vibration measurement. Uh, analysis and uh, mitigation mitigation I've been working a lot with. So the latest 11 years I've been working in the oil and gas industry. So uh, I think we have a short time, so I need to move uh, swiftly. So uh, you have to come back with questions uh, after uh, the presentation and in the discussion uh, session. Um, what I'm going to cover is uh, our experiences of vibration problems within the oil and gas industry. Try to draw some parallels to the nuclear industry and uh, showcase a uh, high frequency tune mass damper that we have that we call a momentum high, uh, tune mass damper. Um, and uh, come up with some uh, points for discussion at the end. Well, Momentum Technologies is uh, a company uh, which are experts in uh, vibration dynamics and sound. And our goal is to prevent uh, fatigue. And this uh, simple figure uh, sort of summarizes uh, uh, the model we are uh, working with. So we have uh, different forces acting on a mechanical system or an acoustical system. And uh, uh, you have uh, responses that are amplified uh, through natural frequencies. And uh, if uh, you have a good match between the forces and the natural frequencies, you get resonance, and uh, that can ultimately lead to fatigue. So our mission in the moment of technologies is to prevent accidents that are caused by vibration and sound. And um, a typical... Uh, way of working for us. Uh, we divide this into three uh, main areas. And uh, a typical thing uh, we would uh, experience is that uh, a client calls us. Uh, we were actually called today uh, by some oil company uh, asking us to uh, study some uh, yeah, rare phen phenomena they uh, experience after some uh, changes in, uh, in operating the system. And then uh, we can bring different kinds of equipment. We are sort of limited uh, to what we can bring with us on helicopters because uh, most of the jobs are offshore. Uh, so this is uh, uh, just a subset of some of the sensors that we can use while we're out uh, offshore. Uh, next, we can do analysis of the measurements or we could do simulations. Uh, before going out or afterwards to try to uh, figure out uh, the root cause of the problem. And what uh, differs uh, us from many other uh, consulting companies is that we, we don't just stop there. We, we try to come up with physical solutions. And uh, here is uh, just a subset of uh, what we can deliver. So we have tube mass dampers and viscous dampers. We also provide uh, wireless uh, vibration monitoring systems. Um, uh, on top of that, we do development. 
uh, on uh, various types of uh, damping solutions. So, um, what are the parallels uh, in the oil and gas and the nuclear industry? Of course, you have large consequences. That is the the biggest uh, parallel. And uh, even though it's only this uh, example here from Alexander Kjellan, which uh, was due to fatigue, I, I think, uh, the consequences of a failure can be massive. We usually work on uh, pipe fatigue, and it's well known that uh, a big uh, piece of the, the pie, so to speak, uh, on the causes of pipe work failure, are due to fatigue. And uh, these are uh, statistics from the UK, but we have similar statistics that are reported in, uh, in Norway. So vibrations are handled on a very open uh, basis in Norway. So uh, all incidents, even unharmful ones, are tracked on the oil rigs and reported. And uh, in Norway, we have uh, Petroleums Tilsyne. Uh, so we, if you go on to ptil.nu, you can uh, look on uh, all the information that they gather. And they do regular inspections and investigations here from accidents. And here are some examples of major uh, incidents that has happened in the recent years, which are reported and thoroughly uh, described in these reports. Um, what is common in uh, the oil and gas industry is that you have uh, small groups, either in the oil companies or in the engineering companies working on this, that has a very high uh, knowledge about uh, vibration, uh, but it is limited to those, uh, those people. And uh, you have gathered some knowledge in uh, different technical requirements, and uh, you have Norshock uh, standards and also guidelines that are used uh, to uh, sort of have control over vibration. But uh, the main thing is that uh, most people working in the oil and gas industry don't have very much uh, experience in vibration and dynamic problems. So uh, you have a set of guidelines that can be used, uh, but uh, it's rarely uh, common that uh, that people offshore, for instance, uh, work on these problems. So that's where we come in. And um, of course, if you want to solve the problem, you need to find the root cause of the vibration. And here is just a list of uh, some of the things you can go through to try to figure out the root cause of a problem. And uh, I will highlight these three areas. So elimination of vibration mechanisms based on uh, fluid phase and energy sources that are available. And uh, next, the measurement and ana analysis uh, part and uh, shed some uh, own experiences. So one very usual, uh, very useful um, uh, tool uh, when trying to figure out uh, mechanism is the use of uh, uh, sorting of mechanisms based on the available energy sources and what phases the different fluids can have. So here is a list from a common guideline that is used in the oil and gas industry. Uh, it's uh, uh, the acronym is AVIF. And here is uh, sort of the main categories of uh, what can occur and which types of uh, uh, fluids you can have them in. Um, another very important tool if, is, of course, to study measurements. And different types of uh, measurements can be sort of put together. So you could do both uh, vibration measurements, uh, stress uh, measurements, uh, sound measurements, pulsation measurements, and you could study 
especially the, the spectra are of uh, importance. So these are some examples. So uh, if, for instance, if you have uh, tonal components, which are typically spaced uh, regularly on the frequency spectrum, it's typically due to uh, machinery or acoustic resonance. Uh, whereas if you if it's not regularly spaced, you have mechanical resonance. And if these uh, tonal components are shifting, you could have uh, intrusive elements where you have varying flow or uh, pressure drops over uh, valves, for instance. You're talking about uh, low frequency content. So if you have very low frequency content, it's typically due to flow-induced vibration, where you have random excitation. Um, the typical criteria that is used to determine if uh, vibrations are too high uh, in the oil and gas industry is by first using uh, accelerometers uh, to, uh, to quantify the vibration levels. And they are quantified usually in the, in the frequency spectrum. Uh, we use the criteria in uh, the AVIF typically, if it's not uh, due to, for instance, reciprocating uh, machinery. Um, but uh, when you're working on pipes, we don't stop here when you see a concern or problem level. You continue with the stress, stress measurements. Uh, by using strain gauges or strain sensors. And there they have put up uh, some criteria for when to stop. Uh, and this can shut down the whole platform if, uh, if you find this during, uh, during an in, uh, inspection. Uh, so you have this as uh, sort of the main, main uh, criteria. And then you have some secondary criteria based on time domain uh, data, so uh, RMS levels, um, and I have compared this to one of the reports I found on uh, on uh, Energy Forsk's uh, sites, and uh, they seem to be in somewhere similar to some of the criteria that uh, are mentioned there. So looking at uh, experience, experience is, I think, very important. It's crucial to sort of figure out uh, when, what kind of uh, problems you have. And these are some examples of uh, flow-induced vibration uh, uh, happenings. So uh, you have typically a turbulent single-phase flow, uh, typically for nat natural gas. And uh, in Norway, we have a falling production of, uh, of oil and gas. I think the whole world uh, is like that. Peak oil has, uh, has uh, been obtained. And we are seeing more high velocity uh, production due to low pressure production. Uh, then we have multi-phase uh, well stream, um, including uh, flow, the slug flow. And uh, this has been thoroughly been studied, uh, how different uh, types of, uh, of well flow, so oil, gas, and, uh, and water, typically. Uh, so we have some ways of figuring out what the forcing will be uh, due to different types of flow. Uh, then we have water systems. This is very typical. So you have seawater and produced water and fire water systems. All these can have uh, problems. Next, we have uh, acoustic induced vibrations. And uh, yeah, you can have many different sources, but uh, here are three that are uh, very common. So we have uh, high frequency sound generated uh, at high pressure drops at uh, valves typically. So here is uh, a few examples of that. And then you have um, sound that is generated when they are transported past dead legs, as shown here. So you have a valve, for instance, uh, that is closed here and uh, gas uh, passing uh, through this main pipe, creating this uh, acoustic resonance. 
And uh, third, you have uh, gas typically again that is transported through corrugated pipes uh, known as a singing riser. So uh, that is a rare uh, phenomena, but uh, sometimes it occurs. Next, you have machinery. Um, platforms, you can have uh, both high frequency and low frequency types of machines and both uh, reciprocating and, and uh, rotating uh, machinery. And uh, those can uh, transmit uh, uh, either energy through uh, air or through structure. So through the gas or, or through the uh, yeah, fluids uh, or to the structure, both the pipes and the members uh, that the structures are fun founded on. And uh, the fourth uh, category is sort of the general category, and I would bring up uh, Thermowell as the sp a special uh, uh, element that we are focusing a lot on, because we see a lot of failures uh, happening, and uh, it's known that uh, uh, facilities that were designed before 2012, uh, I think, uh, had uh, can have uh, big vibrations due to inline vibration uh, in the flow. So this is my no wise uh, approach to the vibration problems uh, in uh, the nuclear industry. So when referring to the simplified sketch of how a, a nuclear power plant works, uh, you might have uh, multi-phase problems near the condenser. That's only my guess. You have to apologize my experience in the experience. Um, you have uh, the water systems. Um, yeah, near the condenser and feed water. And you might have uh, acoustic induced vibrations in the steam uh, area. Uh, you might have uh, high frequency sound perhaps low frequency sound also from uh, turbo machinery due to blade passing or, or, the, or the RPM. Uh, pumps for feed water, um, anti-surge systems for the turbine. And uh, I also guess that you can have problems with the thermal wells because the standard for thermal wells were, were uh, rewritten based on uh, an incident on a nuclear power plant in Japan in 1995. So uh, when uh, providing damping solutions, because I'm going to go over to uh, using a tune mass damper now, we typically think of uh, what frequencies are we working on, what kind of problem we have, and whether you have the uh, possibility to support uh, the damper, so connect it to, to, to foundation. So you have for flow induced vibrations and, and vibration problems due, uh, under 50 hertz, you typically will use the viscous dampers. For machinery pipes, dead legs, uh, or acoustic resonances, we would mainly use uh, momentum TND. We'll come back to what that is. Um, and for higher frequencies, uh, shell modes where the where the walls of the main pipe, for instance, can vibrate, uh, you would uh, consider a constrained layer solution. As I mentioned, I will now focus on uh, the momentum TMD. So what is a TMD? This is a simplified uh, overview of uh, the dynamics of a TMD. So on the left side here, you see the main structure. And for this is only one degree of freedom. So a mass connected to a spring and some damping. And for uh, steel structures, you have very little damping. So this can be very small, so 1% or lower. And then we attach a tune mass damper 
which is basically a mass connected to the main system with a spring and a damper. And what you obtain by doing this is that you have the original resonance or the response of the, the piping. And when you put on a tube mass damper, you try to obtain a response like this. And this is very dependent on how close uh, you are to the locations of high vibration, so-called antinodes, and uh, how much damper mass you have in the damper in damping system, and how well you tune the damper. Uh, a tune mass, uh, a momentum tune mass damper is sort of a special type of tune mass damper um, because it can act on medium to high frequency uh, frequencies. It can be tuned approximately to the range of 30 to 300 hertz. That's the, that's for the dampers, not the, the problem. What you see is that it can work on uh, several kilohertz uh, in uh, range. It's a clamp on solution, as you could see here. And um, we've seen through thorough studies that uh, this uh, damper can work on a multitude of, uh, of natural frequencies. So this is just an example. We could see that it's working on a broad range of natural frequencies and multiple nodes. And it can act in all degrees of freedom. So, and uh, it, uh, one big thing in the uh, oil and gas industry, it, it, it needs to be qualified um, for, for use. And it's been qualified for use in tough environments, so high, high temperatures and high pressures. This is uh, just a demonstration on how this would uh, work. Uh, so this is an amplified video of a pipe without a damper. And with the same amplification, you could see that when attaching a damper here, the, the vibration is uh, virtually gone. Many of the um, dampers that we delivered are uh, deliver are worldwide uh, deliveries. And um, we've uh, developed a collaboration platform, which make it uh, possible for customers to approach us and uh, send us just a very small subset of uh, what they have of data. So typically it would be finite element matrices, not uh, mass spring and damp damping matrices, but uh, just a subset of, uh, of uh, matrices that I, they have. Or they could have measured FRFs in the most important uh, nodes. And we can run an optimization loop on these measurements and come up with an optimized damper. And this could be either produced directly or, or they could put this into their own finite element models. So at last, I will uh, talk about uh, a, a case that we worked on for an LNG facility in Australia where we, that we never visited actually. Um, and uh, here, they had a problem that uh, it was an acoustic problem, but uh, they were not able to brace the piping. So a small bore, bore connection that they had problems with. So uh, just bracing was not uh, sufficient to bring the vibration or the stress levels down to acceptable levels. So they needed dampers as well. And by doing a combination of a finite element uh, uh, analysis and FRF uh, measurements, we could study what would happen when putting on dif different dampers on different uh, localizations and could also uh, find the theoretical uh, reduction of vibration. It resulted in uh, a production and shipment and installation. And here is uh, just some pictures from the installed site. You can see this white here is, uh, is a sunscreen because this is in the desert of Australia. So that's the reason for that. So, um, 
And this is the final uh, reduction. So you can see it was, these are the requirements. These are the frequencies uh, tuned for. And uh, this is the reduction that we have achieved. So the peak reduction for uh, vibration what was at least uh, half of the original vibration levels. So this is the poorest one, poorest results. Um, this has been uh, now delivered to uh, many other applications too. This is an example of uh, a machinery where you have uh, pipes, uh, very slender pipes that have uh, vibrations. Uh, these are can be a combination of forced vibration or or, or resonant vibration, but uh, they act very well on actually uh, very high forcing from uh, from this machinery. Uh, yeah. And uh, last, we have also delivered uh, dampers uh, for subsea use. And here is an example of a, a smaller pipe where we have installed subsea dampers attached uh, to some valves. Um, yeah, so this is collaboration, worldwide co collaboration as well. So, yeah, that's uh, basically what I have. Um, here are some uh, proposed topics that uh, I would like to discuss at least um, because I'm coming from a different area. And uh, if it was possible to get some uh, learning uh, by comparing uh, similarities and differences, um, it would ver be very useful for us at least. Um, how the vibration is handled. Uh, we sort of uh, heard a little bit about that uh, uh, so far. Um, what vibration mechanisms are not uh, relevant um, for you? And uh, do you have any statistics of reported incidents and how many of them are due to fatigue? Um, and uh, we would also be very curious about um, why the TMDs uh, are not very common in the nuclear industry, because I've looked into some of the reports found on uh, the Energiforsk site, and I could see that uh, I think it was only one place that had, uh, at the moment, uh, tuned mass dampers. And uh, is this due to uh that uh, it's mainly low frequency problems or uh, you find uh, tune mass dampers difficult to tune and get working um or do you find that the uh, frequency range uh, is considered too narrow for uh, at least the uh, normal tnds uh, you have qualification criteria that uh, are, could not be met or something like that so um, yeah that's all I have. Okay, thank you very much, Ivan, for a yeah, very, very good uh, presentation, very interesting. And uh, according to the slides, I, I saw you uh, presented on the, the problems and how uh, nuclear uh, plants works. I, I think you have uh, un understand that, um, the issues we are dealing with in a uh, very good manner. Uh, perhaps we have time for one short question, but but uh, before I just want to say, of course, we we can set up a separate workshop where we can discuss uh, those issues that you have on your slide here. It will be very interesting that we can have a, uh, a, dis a further discussion related on how we can um, exchange knowledge between the different uh, branches to see what we can learn from each other. So we, we, we will come back to that and set up a separate a workshop uh, related to those issues and perhaps on other issues and, and have a uh, further discussion on that if mm. that is uh, what you're interested in. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, I mean, now we're this, there's only one minute left and yeah. I see there are there are a couple of hands up, but I, I guess we, we, we need to uh, keep those questions to the um, to the joint to the to the discussion forum 
at uh, at one o'clock. Yeah, if that's okay. Uh, so yeah. both Elizabeth and uh, and Ryan has uh, raised their hands, but we don't have time for that now. So, but uh, once again, thanks for a very good presentation, Ivan. Thank you. So now it's time for the second afternoon presentation, and it will be on a energy fosc uh, financed uh, project regarding uh, tablet PC ap application for the DIA matrices. And it has been mainly performed by Henry Sjöberg, who was a master's thesis student. And I perhaps it's has uh, off, since he has finalized his uh, thesis, perhaps he has been employed in the in the industry. But you can uh, explain that Henry in a while. And I'm not sure. Perhaps that Paul will also join in the presentation. Uh, so are you ready, Henry, to uh, start your presentation? Yes, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay. So I can uh, share my screen. Yes. You're right. I'm not sure if Paul is able to uh, be part of the presentation, but let's see. Yep. Okay. Perfect. You, yeah. You're welcome. Go ahead, Henry. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so. Thank you all. Uh, I'm uh, Henry Schieberi. I'm a master, uh, master's student uh, of Tampere University. It was formerly uh, Tampere University of Technology when I got, got in, but uh, it's, uh, it's now merged uh, as a Tampere University. Uh, I'm currently working uh, for uh, the Trendion and subcontracting to TVO, so I'm uh, closely, closely working with TVO and uh, working on site in TVO. And, uh, uh, working with Paul Smegens, I'm sure you some some of you know him. Okay, so uh, first of all, I I like to give a few thanks, and first of all, uh, of course, for Energy Force for uh, like uh, ordering and financing this project and uh, providing this platform to present, and uh, then of course for Elomatic uh, who. Uh, provide me the opportunity and tools and all assistance during the development and, uh, it, and the project was uh, ordered uh, or uh, ordered from Elmatic to, to Energy Forsk. Uh, and to, Tony Harpersel and Leo Siipola were the supervisors, supervisors and uh, thanks to them for providing uh, practical assistance and uh, uh, tools for the job. And uh, all of course, uh, big thanks to uh, Paul Smekes from uh, TVO. Uh, he has uh, provided all the guidance and uh, acted as a major supervisor for the whole project and whole application. And uh, and I could currently work working with him uh, uh, in TVO. So here here's uh, some something I'm uh, going to tell you about. Uh, first of all, I go through these terms and. Uh, background work of this project just to feel familiarize all with uh, with the terms some of uh, i saw that there's uh, there's a few expert uh, experts on the subject and uh, i won't go into that much in detail but hopefully they, they can answer uh, afterwards any questions that, um, in tech in technical uh, in vibration problems because uh, like uh, sorry about the background so i'm uh, uh, software developer uh, uh, behind my background, so I'm not, I'm not uh, that uh, much research in the technical and vibration problems. I'm uh, for this project. I'm part uh, like my part is to develop the the application and uh, all the things around on around that. So as a background, uh, this time project started as a. a Vibrations. Uh, this project started as a vibration research uh, program under vibrations. Uh, under this vibrations uh, in Energiforsk, and there's uh, several uh, nuclear power plant operators, uh, companies, and energy companies behind this. Uh, the original idea uh, for this uh, DIAM problem solving tool came from uh, Paul Smegers from TVO. And uh, oh, sorry about that. And uh, these current 
current matrices have been um, developed by uh, as a master thesis projects and also other research projects as well. So the pipe vibration uh, matrices have been uh, developed by Mikko Merikoski, part of his uh, thesis, and uh, Reinhard Nordman has been part of uh, for turbine and genera generator vibrations, and e EDG vibrations has been done by Antti Kangasperku. Uh, so about the uh, overall Overall uh, description of the DIAM matrices. So DIAM stands for uh, Detection, Investigation, Analysis and Mitigation, and it is a tool for uh, it is a tool that provides systematic approach uh, for detecting and solving problems in at the nuclear power plant. And in this case, it's particularly uh, solving vibration problems. Uh, but it doesn't uh, exclude that it couldn't be used for any other problems as well, but uh, in this case we focus on the uh, vibration problems. Uh, and this is the, this is a slide uh, from uh, Antti's uh, thesis work, and uh, which illustrates uh, the uh, whole flow of the uh, process. So in these four uh, phases, um, we start with the detection, which is uh, which consists of uh, uh, finding anomaly in a power plant. Uh, and the anomaly um, might be uh, like um, pretty minor or um, minor or a fairly uh, insignificant uh, uh, anomaly in the plant, and uh, it might not be problem in it of itself, uh, but uh, it can be, it, it can be, uh, if for example, uh, like a, some high frequency noise that, that is heard during a inspection, inspe a routine inspection um, route or something like that. And uh, after that, if the anomaly is found, we uh, assess that if the if, if any further investigation is required and then we move on the investigation phase which is about uh, localizing and isolating the problem uh, in this stage uh, the tool provides um, or suggests uh, uh, some methods and uh, measurements uh, what can be used uh, to further investigate the problem and then we move on to the analysis phase uh, or the uh, analysis phase, the, um, the point is to find the root cause for the problem. Uh, and uh, and result of the analysis uh, is um, is the uh, is the found is the, is the root cause. And then in the mitigation phase, uh, we uh, will um, choose the proper um, mitigation method. And uh, this tool will um, will uh, suggest uh, in so, uh, with some probability some methods uh, we can I can show you example later um, and the bottom uh, bottom of the this uh, screen um, illustrates responsibilities uh, what what party is responsible for each uh, each phase so here, uh, detection and investigation is done by the power plant operator or, or power plant personnel uh, and more specifically like um, maybe like inspection organization or something like that um, in analysis phase um, there might be uh, like third party consultant service or uh, something similar uh, which might not be might not be part of the power plant power plant operate, operator company uh, and the responsibility shifts back uh, shifts back to the power plant uh, in the mitigation phase and uh, these gradients uh, in the resp uh, responsibility bars uh, indicate that uh, it, it's not it's not fine it's not uh, like a strict line between um, different uh, different methods 
because in some uh, uh, in some uh, power plants, some personnel might have more uh, expertise or uh, some tools for uh, finding, for example, these uh, root causes. So th that's what this is. Uh, this is specifically no, not specific to any power plant, but like uh, in general. So matrices in Excel, this is uh, what they look like. Uh, this is an example of a detection detection sheet. And uh, the operation is that uh, you mark a un found anomaly uh, in the top row marked yellow. And uh, after that, possible uh, phenomenon or phenomena is uh, is listed uh, in the right hand side. This is not a, a complete complete sheet. This is just to give an example of a, um, a example of a, what what is, what does it look like. And uh, you can have a, you can have proper description how this works uh, from energy force uh, thesis thesis works. They go much more in detail how these are constructed and uh, how the probabilities work and uh, what what are uh, all uh, anomalies and phenomena and um, me investigation methods. They are uh, described much more in detail there. But the uh, whole point of my project is to transfer all these uh, current Excel work into uh, application form. So here's a, here's a like pros and cons about each approach when you, when considering the, these DM matrices. And uh, and the goal is goal of this project was to develop. Uh, user interface for the desktop and tablet environment. Uh, and uh, that would solve all the shortcomings and problems with Excel. And uh, these, uh, I have narrowed these problems for these points shown here. Um, the one or the most significant problem with the Excel, Excel files is that they are single, like single use Excels. They are like a, a disposed after used. And what I mean by that is uh, that uh, when, if I go back to this slide, uh, when one of these anomalies is marked and uh, we have gone through the chain of uh, detection, investigation, uh, analysis, and mitigation, then that Excel is either stored like that or um, then or or, or it, it's disposed like uh, the results results or these x markings are uh, um, taken away so we lose the information so this leads this leads to um, very very um, fragmented fragmented uh, environment that these data storage and maintainability are like uh, uh, linked in, in the sense that uh, if we want to store these uh, uh, DM Excels, we will result in multiple Excel files with uh, which needs to be stored somewhere in the file system. And uh, problem with that, that some of the data uh, in the Excels might be incomplete uh, and there might be uh, multiple copies of the data, and uh, and the maintainability is uh, fragmented in that sense. Uh, as for the application, it, it has a central database uh, which only contains uh, one copy of the data, and uh, it's it uh, it's kept organized in that sense uh, that it cannot be. It cannot be um, like 
a single Excel file cannot uh, mess with uh, the database. The, the next, next point about user guidance and visible information is that uh, uh, the Excel interface might be confusing or overwhelming because there's so much um, information shown at once. Um, with um, with a tablet user interface or uh, or any desktop user interface, desktop user interface in the application, we can only uh, or we can choose to uh, choose the data we we can uh, we want to show, and we we can set thresholds um, for the data. Uh, I, I will get an example later about that. Uh, and the workflow workflow with the Excel's. Well, it's pretty simple in that sense uh, that you will just um, follow the uh, Excel workbook, uh, the sheets in the Excel workbook, and um, mark the um, uh, findings. But um, with the uh, tablet uh, and desktop uh, approach, we can make much more uh, flexible. Uh, approach to that, and I will I will come to that point as well. Uh, come to come back to that. Uh, the use of historic data that's uh, pretty much uh, also also relates to the um, data being stored in the database and and the main maintainability. Uh, so, with the single use Excel files, it it might be uh, hard to combine informations uh, from multiple Excel files uh, like if we want uh, if we want to combine data from multiple uh, uh, diam uh, diam uh, uh, like files uh, which, which which are related to each other uh, that might be hard but uh, with um, with the data being stored in a database, uh, use of uh, historic data can be uh, can be more easily used for other applications as well. If uh, if uh, if the project uh, uh, if there's a need for project to be a re, uh, for further de develop or some uh, or something like that, and for the user, uh, the Excel interface it's it's pretty much just for uh, experts in the in the vibr like vibration experts who um, who will uh, who will be the part of deciding which mitigation methods and uh, analysis methods are used uh, the application is divided like that so it can be used by inspector personnel or plant personnel and uh, data can be then imported from their device to the central database and the uh, uh, experts and um, um, expert then can, then can use that data which is important. For this is uh, a like illustration of different approaches. So this Excel is the current Excel uh, approach and uh, this uh, uh, figure on the left illustrates uh, the workflow with the tablet and also also how are they uh, different so with the tablet interface um, the data is stored centrally in the database and uh, then the data can be synced with the tablet so that all the data is also stored in the tablet as well. Then we can take the tablet uh, to the plant and make an inspection and mark uh, all the um, necessary markings and then come back to the tablet uh, or, or come back to the office and uh, uh, transfer all the uh, markings to the database. And, and based on that, we can then uh, uh, display the data in the traditional Excel uh, uh, user interface uh, and uh, it, it's implemented uh, that way that uh, the data is shown in the Excel template uh, 
which uh, which uh, which are the their matrices, but uh, the data is is not in fact stored in the um, in the Excel file, and uh, that that Excel file is just for uh, uh, viewing the database. Uh, and I can it will be I will be shown showing that in the demo. Um, so about the hardware. So one part of the project was to choose a, a tablet for this job and um, uh, I was considering uh, already existing devices, which which are um, uh, which are usually Windows-based uh, laptops, uh, and uh, the application is uh, is uh, made as a Windows application, and uh, for um, um, for you uh, like I was I wanted to. Uh, make uniform platform for the desktop side of the application and the tablet side. So we decided on the Windows tablet, which is two in one. It can be easily taken uh, with you on the plant and afterwards it can be used as a laptop uh, in the office. Uh, it co it's completely standalone, but it can uh, it, it's not have to be used like that. It can be just used as a tablet and then uh, all the data can be transferred to the database and then uh, on a proper desktop uh, machine, uh, all the data is uh, can be accessed uh, from the database as well. Uh, about the connectivity, uh, data can be transferred uh, wirelessly uh, or with uh, with a traditional cable or uh, even uh, or even uh, USB sticks. It 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 doesn't need to be connected uh, anywhere for do when you do the markings uh, in a power plant where the connection connectivity might not be uh, well available. Um, but there's a multiple choices as well. Uh, and then I would like to go through the application workflow, which is uh, pretty much similar to the Excel workflow in that sense that there's uh, there's same uh, this D, I, M, A, A, and M phases and detection, investigation, analysis, and mitigation. But, but um, uh, we have um, split these responsibilities even more uh, such that, um, such that uh, the initial, um, initial uh, uh, inspection uh, might be done like uh, like an inspection personnel or in inspection organization in the, in the company and might not be a vibration ex expert uh, himself or uh, and uh, and uh, but I have also marked these like these are not uh, strictly strictly uh, defined boundaries. Uh, and they can they can overlap, or even even uh, in some some cases they might not even exist. In some, the, we might not need to involve third party if it's if it's not if it's not necessary. Uh, about the application workflow, it would uh, start. This is like an example case. It would maybe start in the office where the tablet is uh, synchronized from the uh, from the PC or uh, the central database. Then the route inspection route would be started and uh, we have, we would go to the plant uh, during the plant we might uh, find some anomalies and these would be would be um, marked and uh, and each in each uh, step we can uh, eliminate the whole process if there's not some, nothing significant or or we cho choose to choose to uh, terminate the uh, uh, procedure or uh, but uh, after the anomalies we would mark the findings and trans and uh, after that the one use case would be that we won't we don't have the equipment to do uh, 
the analysis phase. So we would uh, return to the office and transfer the data to the tablet. And then uh, expert personnel would uh, assess the need for third party and, uh, and, and then they would come and uh, their findings would be marked uh, not on the tablet, but uh, on the desktop side, uh, desktop side, and uh, it, they would, and the tool would just then just test um, mitigation, mitigation method uh, for the problem. So now I would show you this uh, proof of concept demo I've been working on. So. So this is, well, this is pretty much uh, still proof of concept. I've been working on this uh, uh, during, during my work. And uh, this is, uh, this, this would be situation uh, when we have already si uh, synchronized the tablet and started the route and we would be uh, then marking the anomalies and uh, uh, in investigation findings, so we would be on the plant. But this is a pretty difficult uh, uh, demo, but uh, because I don't have the actual, because I'm not actual, on an actual device and there's no data transfer now uh, between anything. So I would choose a route, and then uh, on a on a component, I would uh, the presented with all the um, anomalies which, which can be found on that. These are all pretty much all the placeholders still, but uh, for example, we might, uh, uh, we might choose a leakage and then we would mark the anomalies and then the program would, uh, uh, it would guide us in, in the sense that we would uh, always perform these pre-checks. Checks, these are not, uh, not that significant, but they're, they're there just to guide the user. And, uh, and here in the investigation methods, uh, these, are, these are already th uh, threshold uh, like that, that there's the, the insignificant methods are uh, not shown and it's threshold in, uh, I, th I believe, I, I think it's 10% the, the here. And then we can uh, mark um, investigation um, method to be something and then we can save to uh, save and that would store them in the database and then we can open the excel which which is uh, in this case generated from the database uh, and uh, this is um uh, this is where we uh, left off so all the phases uh, uh, up to this point is uh, is uh, is filled is filled here uh, and uh, we are in the investigation findings phase here. But this here we would uh, mark uh, what we would have found uh, in the investigation. So that's pretty much for the demo part. So that would be all for me. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I will be uh, in the in the other uh, teams meeting, and uh, hopefully there will be some other uh, DM experts. Uh, hopefully, if they have, if someone has uh, more specific questions about. Um, uh, about the uh, actual methods and phenomena and uh, yeah, anomalies and uh, things like that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Henry, for a very nice presentation and for uh, for good performed work. It would be interesting to uh, actually test the, the demos and then out on the plant in in the real in the real work. And and it's an important step to go from the DM which we have. Uh, produced in earlier project to uh, to really get get out information and, and be able to use it at as an 
at an easy, uh, accessible way. So it's yeah, it, it's a it's a it's a vital project for the for the program in order to um, to really use the the, the previous project uh, and the results from the previous project. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, we, we don't really have time for any questions, but, but perhaps uh, Paul, are you with us? Do you want to just give us a short comment or some extra in information regarding the project since you have been closely involved in it? Yeah, uh, uh, my, my comment is that Henry has come very far after a slow start, so to say. Uh, he's actually still been working on the project and uh, but I think for a project like this to really be a professional tool uh, we, we would like need <laughs> some more projects but uh, you can very well see see the idea behind this now that and it's pity that we couldn't have the demo live because then you, you would actually see that when you choose at the DM, at the at the detection page, then actually the 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 application will come back to you and, and suggest investigations. And you could do this, you could do that. So even if you would have a non-vibration experts, if 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 you would have the tools to do these investigation, he or she could already then at the same time do the do the uh, extra investigations and put in crosses for that as well, so that when coming back to the office and and uh, and 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 this part is put back into the database, then uh, the experts would have already one, yeah, you know, one more step of results, one more step of in of information to do their work. Uh, I, I think. Uh, yeah, the, the possibilities are are huge in for this uh, for this tool, and uh, yeah, I think I think it has been a, quite a success uh, for a master thesis work to to get this far with this tool, and it's also very funny that we re, that for us the, the Excel remain remain remains and basically. Uh, as, as Henry said, Excel is thrown away after use, and then whatever you have put in there, it will again be put into the database. And uh, and the idea is also that you then can connect it to one, uh, let's say, problem-solving project, which is related either to the diesel or to the piping or to whatever. And and as all these possible problems. It, during the time will be gathered in this database, then, then when getting further, then the old problems can help you with new problems, or or the the the, the tablet could, could tell, hey, we have had, or, or the expert part could tell, we have already had this type of problems, and previously we solved it in this way, or we did that, or whatever. So that uh, yeah, and what's funny is also he said that the the path of inspections going into the plant and and we all know that we have these weekly or monthly paths that our inspectors go through to different machines and they walk through the plant they hear things they see things and and this and all that information now can be put on to the tablet and then uh, that has not been much further developed but then Actually, then you, as you have it in the database, you can connect it to a either a machine or a project or something else, so that it it has. You can select even better that it belongs to some specific problem for which you are now trying to find the root cause. So yeah, this is a, is a very very nice tool, and it's really a pity we don't have a face-to-face -face meeting to actually have these machines and and see what they really do yep. but maybe for the next face-to-face -face. yeah we hope so yep. thank you very much yes uh, thank you for those two presentations now i would like you to uh, join the, the breakout session so uh, and then get back uh, at 15 past one for the for the main session where we have the the last two presentations so so please welcome to the to the breakout session
So welcome back to the main session. Just want to check uh, you want also are you with us? I'm way about. Perfect. Uh, can you try to share your presentation also? Yep. Mm. Is this visible to be us? Yes, I can see it. Perfect. Good. Nice. Now we go into the last two presentations, and now it's from experiences from uh, from Skasam and Fosmark. So um, yeah, it would be interesting to hear what they have to say. But first, we have Johan Olsson from, from Skasam. He will give us a presentation on resonances in diesel engine driven pumps. So uh, please, Johan, uh, the floor is yours. OK, my name is uh, Johan Olsson and I work at the mechanical department at Skasam nuclear plant. And um, mainly I work with uh, applications including uh, combustion engines and that could be in the form of diesel engines or gas turbines and also applications uh, driven by those generators and pumps mainly. Um, today I will uh, run a presentation about some uh, real life problems we ran into uh, with our ICC pump. That's on the picture there. And ICC, that stands for uh, independent core cooling. And uh, so this machine here is the major part of the, or the heart that was implemented uh, following new regulations after the Fukushima accident in 2011. Yeah, and the title is Resonance in, uh, in Diesel Engine Driven Pump. That's pretty much self explaining, I think. So, a uh, uh, small agenda for this presentation. I will run through some definitions. I will uh, show you some specifications we made to the supplier as a background. I will show you the verification steps. Uh, corrective actions and uh, also what we chose as the final solution or final corrective action. Okay, some defini definitions. Uh, I only have three definitions here and, and probably most of you already know them, uh, uh, but anyhow, I run through them. So the first is uh, eigenfrequency or natural frequency. A definition could be that this is the frequency at which a system tends to oscillate in the absence of any driving or damping force. Uh, the second is the firing frequency of an engine. So this is the excitation frequency. Uh, in a four-stroke engine, each cylinder fires once every second revolution, uh, and uh, so that means that each cylinder fires every crankshaft angle of 720 degrees. Um, and uh, if you include all cylinders, then the expression for the firing frequency in total is, is, uh, is according to the expression below. So, for example, for a straight six cylinder engine, which I will speak about here, a firing frequency then occurs at the third order running speed frequency. And uh, of course, there are uh, multiples to that. And uh, this is surely one of the most severe excitation frequencies in, in engines, so it's very important. And uh, third definition. Uh, resonance, which describes the increased amplitude that occurs when the frequency of an excitation is equal or close to a natural frequency. So, so to sum up, if the uh, eigenfrequency according to definition one and the excitation frequency according to number two here is, is the same, then uh, resonance is given.
And uh, this is just the uh, extract from a basic specification that we wrote or I wrote a long time ago. <laughs> so this is just the background, what we wanted for, for uh, the ICC. So this should consist of a diesel engine, pump-based frame coupling, combustion air system, cooling water system, and so on. And it should produce then uh, uh, a flow between approximately 20 to 100 kilograms per second at given system curves. And uh, somewhere around 2017, KSP was uh, chosen as a supplier. And because of our requirements on, on flow and pressure head, uh, it then operated at two speeds according to the sign. So we have one at 1220 RPM, and there we have uh, like pressure head of four bars and flow of 20 kilograms per second. And then we have a higher speed at 1643 RPM with a pressure head of uh, 10 bars and flow of approximately 100 kilograms per second. So this is uh, pretty much everything I will mention about the process parameters in in this. Okay, so if you look into a specification, that's what we require the, for a vibration requirement. So we have uh, two meanings here. One is that the DPZ should be proved by analysis and test, not to have any resonance frequencies within plus minus 20% of the speed of flow range. And then we also apply the vibration um, speed limit uh, in general uh, to 20 millimeters per second within plus minus 20% of the speed of flow range. So this is pretty much what we required from the supplier. Just show you some. This is pictures from a FAT in Germany, and um, just to see it in <laughs> in real life, I will just show you. So we have a pump here. This is manufactured from um, KSP, and uh, then we have a between. We have a coupling that's a elastic coupling and a cardan shaft together. And then we have an um, engine, a Volvo D9 six cylinder engine. And this is all mounted on a frame. Actually, there are two frames here, but we have the engine on the engine frame, but that frame is then mounted on the base frame as well as the pump, and that's mounted on directly on the the major base frame. Um, so during this uh, process, the first thing that happened was that we got some analysis of eigenfrequencies and excitations. And actually this analysis shows that we have a resonance in the tam pump uh, with Free engine orders, and that's the firing frequency. This resonance was disregarded by um, the manufacturer, KSP, and also it passed review uh, at the UKB without notice. So no one took care of this problem here in the analysis. And then we went uh, on, we went to the FIT. Uh, at that instance, we measured. Um, uh, vibrations, but we didn't use any uh, frequency spectra, so we just looked at the uh, yeah, vibration velocities there. And since all the values we measured were below 20 millimeters per second, uh, we thought this was okay. So um, we uh, they packed it and they uh, sent it to Sweden and installed it into site.
Okay, and then we um, got to uh, site acceptance test with a fully installed diesel pump unit. And we run it and we measured higher uh, vibration speeds at this instant, up to 30 millimeters per second on the, on the pump, which is too high. And we also evaluated the, the measurements from frequency spectra here. And we had a conclusion that it was a likely resonance between uh, engine firing speed and um, the eigenfrequency of, of the pump at 82 hertz. And to uh, verify the, the eigenfrequencies, we also uh, made a pump test into this. And, uh, we concluded that this was a fact. We had a resonance in the setup. Um, just to show you, uh, this is a campus diagram of a basis. And so I don't know if everyone is familiar with a campus diagram, but on the y axis, we have Hertz, on the x axis, we have RPMs, and then the, the um, maybe I can use this. The horizontal lines, the blue and the dashed red, and the purple and the yeah something else. <laughs> the horizontal lines here. That is the eigenfrequencies of the on the system. And then we have vertical lines here. That's the uh, operating speed. So we have two speeds we are operating in, one at 1220 and one in 1643 RPM. And to the far right, there's also the second multiple of a low speed, that's 2240 RPM. And uh, then the, the slope lines, that's excitations. And we have one uh, engine order, two engine order, three engine order, that's uh, firing frequency then. And then we have four ending orders. And then we have a second multiple of a firing order that's uh, six ending order. And the third multiple of a firing order, that's uh, nine ending orders then. And uh, the start here, uh, yeah. So if you get a, a crossing from the excitations and the natural, natural frequencies here within the speed uh, that you operate, then it's uh, clearly a resonance. So I have three stars here, and they all are resonance. The small, smaller one, they are like uh, secondary resonance uh, situations. But the big one here is, is the firing frequency. The third ending order and the pump horizontal eigenfrequency. So we had to go back to the desk and uh, think for a while what to do about this. And maybe I can. Oh. So, corrective actions then. Uh, three possibilities as we saw it, we could either change the excitation frequency, that's meaning that we change the speed, or we could change the natural frequency of a pump by either change the mass of a pump or change the stiffness of a pump. So either we change the excitation or we change the eigenfrequency. Um, for us, it's it was impossible to change the excitation frequency, the speed, because then we will not uh, get out the requirements on, on flow and head for the pump. Uh, but both a change of mass and change of stiffness were examined during operation, and um, uh, we had the following solution concluded then. So for a short-term corrective action, we actually went out to the pump and loaded it with lead sacks to, to increase the mass. 
Then we got a minor uh, decrease in vibration uh, velocities, but we we judged that this was possible to run uh, with this setup for for a year. And as a final corrective action, uh, meanwhile we designed and installed support to the pump. And this was uh, implemented uh, this year, actually, uh, during the spring summer. So this is what we did, actually, we put in some supports to the pump here. And if you uh, conclude this uh, in the uh, same Campbell diagram, you can see that the red dashed line here that's the uh, same as the original so it's not not really there but i, I have it to show that's been transformed into a green so the eigenfrequency of a horizontal uh, pump eigenfrequency has moved from 82 to 92 hertz and obviously the crossings is now far outside the uh running running speed here there's no problem and at the same time we we uh, decrease the vibration velocities from 30 to under four millimeters per second so this is um yeah that's it <laughs> thank you Thank you very much for that. You are a good presentation, and it's finally also a good solution, so we can have this um, this uh, pump working when when we need it. Yes. Let's see. Uh, yeah, we have two hands up, uh, so please, Adnan, I have a question for you. One. Uh, hello, you one. I just wonder if you have done any testing to figure out if there is any torsional resonance in the coupling. Yeah, that's nothing that we have seen, Adnan, into no. this. No. no just wondering. Yes. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, we also have uh, Rainer Norma. You have a question? Yes. My question is, you showed us uh, that there is a natural frequency at 82 hertz, and you wanted yes. to shift it. But you didn't show how the mode shape of the pump was. Because when you do changes, you should know when you can act some changes. And can you say something about it? Um, what, okay. Was it in, inside the pump or outside the pump, or was it only the, the support of the pump? Did you know? Uh, yeah, yes. we, I think we have it. But the mode shape in general was according to this uh, picture here, Ryan. On. So it's uh -huh. a horizontal uh, pump. Okay. Eigen mode, swinging ah, from, yeah, 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 from yeah. one okay. side to another. Okay, maybe I missed it when you uh, explained it, because this is important when you do a change, you need to know what's the best location to change. Yeah, yeah. but yes, yeah. you have found it, yes. Yeah, and we did, did look into that uh, pretty much, so I think I missed to, to speak about that right now. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, good, thanks for that. Uh, we have another question, Elisabeth. Please. Uh, I can just comment uh, to, to we have done an ODS on this pump before and after modification. And, and it's very clear that this, this mode shape is global and horizontal on graphs. Yeah. It was more to normal. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ioana, did you involve the, some of the manufacturer supplier of the equipment or, or was it uh, OKG responsible? Or did, did you take your responsibility by yourself to... to no, to, what, to what we situation? did... What we did was that we, we went out there during operation and tried uh, changing the mass with lead sec. 
and also uh, to uh, put in some uh, supports um, just typing to mm. to uh, make it and but then we concluded that th this would be a good solution and then we handed it over to uh, KSP so they did uh, the design of a support and also implemented it okay okay just a curious, uh, did, we, 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 we did, did we know the actual uh, uh, frequency of, of the pump corresponding to the to the running speeds of the of the engine previously? Or, or, or did, did we do that that overall analysis before the installation? Yeah, I don't. I mean, this was shown in uh, analysis. I mean, long before. Yeah. Uh, so it was uh, actually there on the paper. Yeah. If I it, say so. It it so. it was uh, considered uh, in in the analysis work b before. Uh, the yeah, it was considered, but it was disregarded by KSP. They they didn't think that uh, this uh, excitation would uh, plant itself out through a through a structure. And um, but uh, I think that you should never allow a uh, resonance in anyhow. That no. should be a no, no, no. Yes. Anyhow. 